All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in our final uh, pipeline series talk here uh, hosted by Black and Cancer. Um, my name is Mamadou. I'm a second year PhD a student here at Wa Cornell Sloan Kettering um, and also one of the directors of mentorship and outreach uh, for Black and Cancer. Um, I'm joined by the rest of the team uh, based in the UK, Dr. Julia Morris and, and Ray Harewood. Um, and today we have a phenomenal talk um, by Chris, Chris Bourne. He is a 50 year PhD candidate at Wall Cornell Sloan Kettering. Um, he received his BA in biology and Spanish literature from Swarthmore College. Um, for his graduate work, he studies uh, cancer mean therapy, specifically, um, uh, specifically how T cells are used to deliver drugs to tumors and uncovering novel immunotherapeutic uh, targets. Um, he's really passionate about diversity in biomedical research and helps run programs and, and committees to improve recruitment, retention, and promotion of underrepresented scholars. He is also the director of scholarship for Black and Cancer and has played a very instrumental role in establishing collaborations and funding sources. And beyond the lab, Chris is a, is a work-life balance enthuse and an avid OK biker. Not too great. <laughs> um, but today he will be giving a talk on a very important topic, uh, which is leveraging social media to your academic and, and professional advantage. Um, he was able to convince me to really establish a professional uh, social, media, social media account and hopefully he'll do the same. So with that, feel free to use the chat function, um, drop your questions, comments, and concerns to address at the end of the talk, um, unless uh, Chris wants to engage during the talk. And with that, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Chris. Thanks for the intro, Mamadou. Um, okay, so, so this actually will be a pretty interactive uh, presentation and we have a small group. So, you know, hopefully the people here can, can get some, some insights and some interesting things that they can take away from this presentation. So I'll be talking about using uh, social media to your professional advantage with an emphasis on science and med Twitter. I you know, pretty much only use uh, Twitter. Uh, we'll talk about you know, all the different platforms that there are that you can use. Um, but I think Twitter, you know, is, is, it's been really beneficial for me. And I think that it has a lot of tools that really help um, academics and scientists. So a key question to get started, um, this is the question that I asked myself when I started my professional account was, what am I going to showcase about myself in order to facilitate authentic networking? So, so this presentation is going to be about my own experiences using Twitter to further either my academic scholarship or my outreach interests. So first, I think we should talk about what is networking. And I think really what people dread about networking is the idea of meeting strangers at social events and just striking up a random conversation cold emailing people, you know, if you have similar interests, and really just the, the being nervous, anxious, or awkward, forced introductions and interactions. This is at least what I think of when you hear the word networking, networking events. But I also want to put, you know, this other option out there, which is the, the way to network organically and authentically. So having an interest in connecting with people while doing that interest, so naturally connecting with people while doing that interest. Um, working together with people outside of your immediate circle to achieve a common goal. So this, a good example of this is volunteer work. And then just being yourself and having relationships form organically. I think that the networking relationships that form organically and as a result of, you know, some sort of common goal tend to be the strongest, you know, and, and most useful um, uh, networking. So Let's also talk about professionalism because I know that this term is used in a lot of different contexts and you know I want to kind of break it down into what I consider more of a constructive professionalism versus what might be a little bit more of a, of a oppressive uh, professionalism. So in a constructive professionalism you have mutual respect. People are mindful of others life experiences. Um, people, you're, you're informed and you're centering others, but you're advocating for your needs and the needs of your community. So you're, you're being dependable, reliable, and respectful. But there's also more of an oppressive form of, of professionalism. And I really want to get away 
from this type of professionalism, which is being judged for a parent's identity or life experiences, meeting standards that might be rooted in white supremacy, gatekeeping opportunities under the guise of tradition, you know, sometimes the idea that, you know, you can't call yourself a scientist until you meet this milestone or something like that. And then also staying silent on very important issues to avoid ruffling feathers. So I think that these are aspects of professionalism that I deem very negative. And, and really what I want to do is focus more on the top definition of professionalism. And so there are many different uh, social media spaces. Um, and these are social media spaces, um, you know, very popular ones that there's quite a bit of, of activity among scientists and, and biomedical professionals. So you have Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. I'm really only going to focus on Twitter, but I will touch on some of these other platforms um, and the pros and cons of them. So Twitter, it's a personal blog. There are tweet limits, but you can create threads as long as you like. So some of the pros of Twitter, it's not explicitly professional, as in, you know, it's not a so you don't associate Twitter with work normally, or at least I don't. Um, and this allows you to really showcase your whole self. Uh, you know, I'll talk about LinkedIn a, bit, a little bit later, but LinkedIn is, is more about your professional and career um, aspirations, whereas Twitter can, can really be anything that you deem. You can interact with accounts of all sizes. Um, Twitter actually has quite a few tools to censor misinformation and bullying, um, and you can personalize your timeline. Now, the cons of Twitter. Um, obviously, there's a lot of negativity on all social media platforms, and a lot of the negativity can be favored by the algorithm. Um, so negative tweets can be favored by the algorithm. And then also viral tweets, sometimes I find they just crowd out tweets from, from people that I know. Um, and, you know, they're not always that interesting. So uh, here's a graphic that I got from Dr. Ushma Neal. Um, this is basically just talking about, you know, what are the de different demographics in STEM Twitter, in science Twitter? So you have, you know, 55% of academics on Twitter were awarded doctorates less than five years ago. So a very young population of, of scholars on Twitter. 45% of their Twitter followers are non-scientists. So, you know, the smaller half of their Twitter followers aren't scientists, and then the larger half of their Twitter followers are. Um, this is a really nice stat. The median number of followers on Twitter is 7.3 times larger than the median size of a university department. So when you think about what you're showcasing, and how many people you're able to showcase this to. You know, when you think about doing a talk maybe for your department, you're like showcasing your work to quite a, a, a large number of people. Well, the same is true on Twitter. And then you know, this is another uh, really key publication that came out, which um, shows that papers that are tweeted are three time, have three times more citations. Um, their altimetric score, which is their altmetric score, which is basically just a measure of, of viewership of, of that manuscript, um, it goes up ninefold. Um, and then the percentile, you know, relative to journal and age. So how does your paper rank um, for that journal that it's at and how long it's been published? I mean, just look at the difference. You have 15% compared to 75%. So using Twitter to, to showcase your work actually has real life benefits in terms of the viewership, the readership, um, you know, people are able to see a lot more and a lot of people are using Twitter as a way to find research. So I'm just going to break down um, my own Twitter page, my own Twitter profile and what the different aspects of a Twitter profile are. So you have the name and here I've elected the born immunology. So it's kind of like a pun uh, and a popular culture reference, but of course you can just write Chris Bourne. Um, you have a header image. I actually don't have one, but I should put one because it's just more space to showcase my interests. You have a profile picture. You have a username or a handle at the Bourne Immuno. You have your biography. Um, here you can put a website. I put my ORCID ID, which is just a compilation of all my publications, but you can put a personal website as well. And then you can also pin a tweet. So you can pin one tweet to the very top. And the, pin, the tweet that I have pinned here um, is my Black and Cancer roll call from this past year. So what should you think about when you design a Twitter name, your username, and your profile picture? Well, one is that you could always just put your own name as your Twitter name, and that's actually what most people do. 
But I think that having something creative, um, you know, and descriptive of what your Twitter account is about uh, really helps to gain more attraction um, uh, and attention um, to your account. So, you know, puns, pop culture references, or descriptions of interests um, can work. Definitely use header images, especially for affiliations, interests, and beliefs. And then use a nice headshot for your profile picture if you feel comfortable. Some people will put like a cartoon, a little cartoon avatar or something like that as a profile picture as well. And so these are just some accounts that I follow and I thought that their Twitter names were, were particularly interesting. And I remember that being a part of the reason why I followed them because I was interested by, you know, their Twitter name and how it described what the account was going to be about. You know, mother of astrocytes. So this is a astrocyte researcher, Beyonce of Neuro, um, Rory, ADHD, autistic, OCD, your favorite scientist from the hood. You know, these, these are very creative names, but they also very well describe what you're about to learn about in this account. What, you know, what types of identities does the account holder have? So just using the chat function, I want everybody to just brainstorm two potential Twitter names that are not your own name, of course, that you could use for a, a professional Twitter account. So if you're logged in, you're paying attention, um, just, just drop you know, some, some ideas that you could have a, of a creative name that you could use uh, for a Twitter account. You know, something that has something to do with your interests, who you are, some identities, but kind of ties together everything at solver of problems. I like that. So yeah, I'll just give a minute. All right, so yeah, so, you know, just think about this on your own time um, as well, but I just think it's nice to, to be a little bit creative, especially on social media, you have that opportunity. So what about a Twitter bio and then also pinning tweets? I think, um, you know, in terms of your Twitter bio, you should put your name in your bio if needed. Uh, if you, if, if your name, your t name on Twitter is your actual name, you don't need to do that. But, um, you know, for example, for me, I put my own name list affiliations, hobbies, and identities that you have. So Mother of Astrocytes is an MSU BME PhD candidate, first black a BME BS. Um, you know, your favorite scientist from the hood is a naturalist, PhD candidate, educator, human. Um, you know, Rory, ADHD, autistic, OCD, has interest in ADHD, autism, uh, OCD advocate. You know, all of these things just very succinctly sum up what the account is going to be about. You know, what are some of the key features? And then you could use pin tweets to include more information on yourself. Um, so these two accounts actually just put something a little inspirational as their pin tweet, whereas Rory put uh, access to, to some writing um, to their writing. So, you know, these are just things that you can add so that there's just, there's limits, you know, on your bio to the amount of things that you can list or, or in your website, you know, area. Um, so this is just a way to increase the amount of stuff that you showcase about yourself. So now list you know, three interests or career goals or achievements or hobbies for which you would like to increase your network. So you, you wanna use Twitter specifically to increase the network around these three you know, interests. So I have an example here, I just made this up. Um, if you're an undergrad studying neuroscience, you may wanna use Twitter to, to uh, broaden your neuroscience network. If you're an avid swimmer, you may, may wanna use Twitter to tap into the swimming community. Um, and then I fight for LGBTQIA justice. So you could use Twitter to, you know, either advocate for people with this identity um, or get to know more people who have this identity. These are just potential options. So I just give a minute if you want to just uh, put the, in the chat some of the ideas. And I think it would be helpful to see what ideas other people have. And that might also help, 
you know, you to come up with your own ideas of things um, to add. So I'll just give a minute for that. All right, so one of the ones I saw was uh, research reproducibility. Um, and I think that's an interesting one because I've actually seen, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the account, but I've seen somebody who actually does what's called image forensics and shows in publications where it seems like certain images might be doctored and where you have duplications of aspects of the image on another part of the figure. You know, this is an account on Twitter that does this goes through and finds these types of publications and is really looking for, um, you know, misconduct and, and, um, and falsification and things like that. So again, that is totally available on uh, Twitter. We have um, to secure funding. That's also a great idea because, and I'm gonna actually show this in a moment, but there are accounts, you know, that are associated to the, the um, NIH, uh, HHMI, NSF, and they're posting grant opportunities all the time. Um, and then you also have people that are posting, you know, job opportunities and things like that as well. Health inequalities is another great one. There's a lot of accounts that are posting, you know, on the science um, that are behind health inequalities. Um, yeah, science is for black kids too. So we're gonna talk about that one as well. I mean, we're here at Black and Cancer, create awareness, um, you know, all of, all of these are really, really great. And I'm telling you that there is a place where you can go to expand your network with everything that I see listed here in the chat on Twitter. I've, you know, I've either seen it or I've myself been a part of it. All right. So here are some popular community oriented Twitter accounts. Of course, I'm gonna start with Black and Cancer because that's, that's where we are right now. Uh, you also have Black in the Ivory and they kind of repost Black experiences in academia. Um, you have academic chatter, and academic chatter is great because you can you can kind of send them uh, a question that you might have, you know, a, about maybe some some norm in academia or something like that, and they'll repost it, and then you'll have you know thousands of people that are able to see this post and answer that question. Same is true with you know the PhD voice or just the hashtag uh, PhD chat. Um, and then you also have to say with STEM. Uh, and there, there are a number of other Black and X groups, you know, Black and, you know, Black and Robotic, anything that you can really think of, there's probably a Black and X group around it, and they're probably on Twitter. Um, there's also famous healthcare-focused uh, Twitter accounts. So to get really credible and reliable information, especially now with the coronavirus pandemic, so we have Kismekia Corbett, who um, was instrumental in designing the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, um, Dr. Uh, Uchi Blackstock, who is a MSNBC uh, medical contributor, and the list goes on and on of, you know, credible and famous um, people in the, in the biomedical space. You can also follow STEM institutions and labs. So, you know, the Scheinberg lab, this is my lab. I'm doing my dissertation work in this lab, and we have a Twitter account. This is my graduate program, Wild Cornell Graduate School. Um, and then uh, MSK is where I do my research, but you can also follow a number of other, you know, institutions and individuals and labs. So how do you use Twitter fruitfully, right? I just explained all of these benefits of using Twitter as a way to expand your network in all these different ways, but you know, it's, it's, not, all, it's not all great on, on social media, obviously. And I think that um, there is a way to use it fruitfully in a way that you can actually tap into some of the features that are on Twitter um, to your benefit. So the first thing is engage. Uh, Twitter runs on algorithms. So accounts that you engage with will show up more on your timeline, but also you will show up more on the timelines of accounts that you engage with. 
So it's, you know, it's kind of like this two-way street. The more that you interact with an account, the more that you will see them and they will also see you when you post. And so you can do this by just liking, retweeting, commenting, you know, join the conversation. If it's something of interest to you, just join the conversation and you'll find that that conversation actually shows up more in your timeline. And then a thing to, to note is that some of these official accounts, you know, some of these um, public figures, they might be run by social media teams. So you might not necessarily be interacting with them directly. You know, if you go and tweet at Joe Biden, I don't think he's going to look at his phone and, and see what you tweeted at him. I think that's going to probably be taken care of by his social media team. So more followers does not equal better networking. Um, you know, focus really on the quality uh, and not the quantity of followers and, and you know, new engagements that you have. And choose who you follow back wisely, because eventually they're going to shape your experience on social media. And then, you know, part of the shaping your experience is that you can create lists. So you can stay tuned with, with certain accounts or, or certain groups. So for example, I'm in a Black and X list on Twitter, and this is a collection of all Black and X accounts. So this is where I'll be able to see what's going on, you know, with the different Black and X accounts specifically. So tweeting, um, you know, when you go to tweet, you can add pictures, you can add GIFs. You can poll people um, and, and, you know, all of these are ways to increase the impressions and, you know, the, the I guess, value that the algorithm would assign to the tweet. Um, you know, tweets with pictures and videos, they get more engagements. Uh, you can create threads. Um, this tells you how many characters you have left and you can add emojis as well. So I'm just going to show some examples of uh, analytics on um, some of my tweets that I use, you know, for, for very specific purposes at one point or another. So for example, this is the tweet from the first Black and Cancer Week, the first Black and Cancer roll call. And what you can do is actually go on Twitter and look at the analytics for this tweet and see what are the impressions. So how many people just saw the tweet at all, even scroll past it? Um, what are the total engagements? You know, how many times did people actually engage with the tweet? How many media engagements were there? Did they click on the picture? How many times did they expand the details of the tweet to see more, to see the rest of the thread or something like that? How many times did they click on my profile as a result of the tweet? How many likes, how many retweets? How many times was a hashtag clicked on? How many replies, you know, that you can, you can see a little easier? How many follows as a result of the tweet? And then how many people clicked directly on the link that was on the tweet? Um, and, you know, it's really nice that it can, can break it down for you and show you the impact that a certain type of tweet will have. So the point of this one uh, was visibility. It's Black and Cancer Week roll call. And obviously that was achieved here. Another example, um, I tweeted out a publication that I had um, earlier this year. And again, you're able to see what are the impressions, engagements. And really the one that I like to look at is how many times were the details expanded? You know, because some, within the scientific community, sometimes all you need to do is read the title to kind of understand what, is, what does somebody work on? What are their interests? And, you know, what conclusions did they make in this publication? Two other tweets that um, I wanted to, to point out were tweets where I use my platform as a way to recruit uh, more people to help work on an initiative. So um, in this first tweet on the top here, um, Dr. Zush Manil and uh, Abraham, Abraham Aragones and I were trying to recruit underrepresented scientists to give a presentation on COVID-19 and the vaccines. And so I just put out this tweet. Um, it got lots of engagement and interest. And then in the end, I got a number of people reach out to me and say, I'm interested in participating. And we were actually able to get a group together and go out and give these presentations. I was also looking for um, experts in LGBTQ in STEM. And uh, this was for a course that we're going to be holding at Wild Cornell. So I put this tweet out there and I was able to get interest for people who wanted to be guest lecturers for this course. So, it, you know, it has, a, it has a function, it has a purpose. I can use this as a way not only just to expand my network, but also to get people that have the expertise that I need you know, for a given initiative or program. And then I also want to share this last tweet here at the bottom. How many Black tenure track faculty are at Sloan Kettering? 
because this I consider to be, you know, the first tweet that I made um, that that really, you know, got me fired up about social media, but also got me fired up about how you can use social media to advance social justice. Um, because when I tweeted this, I knew the answer to the question beforehand, but I knew, and, and this was, you know, summer of 2020, so peak George Floyd protesting, um, and I really wanted to bring the issue of, of representation at the faculty and leadership level to the forefront. So I was able to use this tweet, and even though it wasn't, you know, viral by any means, um, the community, you know, the, the community at Wild Cornell and at Sloan Kettering saw this tweet and really uh, started thinking about this, you know, so you can also use it to challenge, um, you know, institutions or, or people with power. Uh, social media really is a, a democratic space. Um, and so this is just a, an example here. You know, I'm, I wasn't trying to be negative, but it definitely, it was a definitely pointed tweet. Um, and then you can just get uh, analytics on your entire account as well. Um, so as you can see, over the last 28 days, I've been a lot less uh, active on Twitter. And that's okay. You don't have to always be active on social media. I personally don't make money off of it. Some people do. And, you know, you can get advice from them on how to make, to monetize your account. I don't make money off of it. So I'm constantly taking breaks and just slowing down uh, with my social media engagement. And then another thing that I really like about um, using social media is that now we're in an era where you can put out a preprint manuscript. So this is a manuscript that is not pe yet peer reviewed. Um, and you can just share that because the peer review process, at least in my field, can take you know, anywhere from one year to, to infinite, really. Um, so by just posting your manuscripts in all of these archives, you have bio archive, med archive, and then the initial archive, which was for like math and physics. Um, and then, you know, they have Twitter accounts, they'll post your manuscript, you can post your manuscript, and you can, um, you know, drum up interest in the, in the research that you're doing even before you have a peer reviewed publication. Okay, so uh, brainstorm two topics that you would be interested to tweet about so that you yourself may want to tweet about not necessarily that you you want to go and expand your network, but these are just topics that, you know, you want to tweet about. But I think really more importantly is brainstorm three topics that, that you will avoid. Brainstorm topics that might trigger you on Twitter and you want to avoid them. So for me personally, this would be anti-vax Twitter. I, I'm having no parts of that, absolutely none. But also for me, it's, it is breaking news because you know I don't really wanna use Twitter to learn about some of the more upsetting stories that, that can develop on a day-to-day -day basis. And the same is true for political debate. I don't wanna use my Twitter account to engage in that too much. You know, national politics is what I'm talking about. I want to stay focused more on grassroots efforts. So this is just my own personal take. But you know, just use the chat function really quickly and just you know, especially brainstorm the topics you will avoid because you can use Twitter functions to actually go ahead and avoid these topics. So let's just take a minute. All right, awesome. So we have some ideas uh, so far in the chat. You know, we have uh, people that have interest in cancer immunotherapy and COVID-19 news, and there's definitely a place for that on Twitter. Um, especially right now, COVID-19 news, you know, I find that I learn most of the emerging things about COVID-19 from Twitter, even before it necessarily hits the national media. You know, you can hear about the experiences on the ground of, you know, healthcare professionals. 
um, and researchers in real time. Uh, is, some of these data aren't published yet, but they're posting figures on Twitter. Interested in tweeting about AI, ethics, innovation, robotics, black women, and artificial intelligence. Awesome. You know, all, all is there. And, and also, uh, you know, there's a black in for, you know, pretty much each of these. Avoid anti-maskers, political trolls. That is very, very key there. There are a lot of trolls on Twitter. Black research getting involved in teaching. Avoid primarily entertainment that is not related to artificial intelligence. I like this point. So one of the reasons that I myself think that it's uh, a good thing to create a professional Twitter account is not so that you hide other aspects of yourself, because I don't think that you should ever do that. I think it's actually so that you yourself can compartmentalize what you view and interact with using different social media accounts. So if you have an account that's specifically professional, well, you would think about this one more associated with your career and work, even if you talk about all different aspects of yourself. Whereas, you know, for example, I have a personal account. All I do on that personal account is talk about how much I hate New York City bike lanes and trash talk Kyrie Irving. I'm not embarrassed about that. And I'll share that freely, but I don't think that that's going to help me network in a professional sense. And so that's why I keep them separate. So this is really what I mean when I say, you know, a professional account is that you can, you can put the, the entertainment or things that you're interested in, you know, means and all of the, these things into another account so that you can access them a lot easier and you don't have to see papers being tweeted at the same time you're trying to relax. Um, but yes, yeah, so thank you for posting in the chats. Uh, these are all, you know, really important and, and great interests and also things to avoid. So on the topic of things to avoid, you know, staying healthy in toxic social media spaces. So there are a lot, there is a lot of toxicity on social media and people use social media to talk about injustices that have happened to them. Um, and sometimes that can be triggering for you if you're reading that as well. So, so that here are some tools that you can use to, to stay positive. Um, first is that you can mute words or topics. If you don't want to hear about it, you can actually mute it and Twitter will prevent it from showing up in your timeline. Use that block button freely. You can block anyone at any time that you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to rationalize it in your head. If it's an account that you don't want to ever interact with, use that block button. Take time off from Twitter. You know, it, it's totally fine. You don't have to think about growing your account at all times. Um, you don't have to think about growing your account really at all. You can use Twitter for whatever your goals are. But I think that sometimes you just need to take time off. You know, when, when, when really bad things happen in the news, sometimes I just have to sign off because it's not what's best for me. Stay focused on your goals for your Twitter account. Um, you know, and then really that ties into the next point, which is recognizing trolls, bots, and accounts that will only waste your time. So if you're staying focused on your goals, it, it's a lot easier to just ignore, you know, the trolls and the bots and, 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 and also the other controversies that you may see retweeted and end up on your timeline. And then I've, you know, made this point a lot, but social media is run by algorithms. And even how long you look at different posts influences your timeline. They're actually able to track as you're scrolling, do you stop and look at the post? How long do you stop and look at the post? because their goal is to get you to look at the post for as long as possible. And that way they can increase their ad revenue. The more that you're on their platform, the more ad revenue they get. So the algorithms are used to keep you on there for as long as possible. So they're tracking all of these things. Social media is also a bubble for everyone. Again, with these algorithms, you are going to be placed into a bubble. And I don't think that social media is actually the best place to learn about opposing viewpoints or about people who you disagree with on moral or ethical topics. I think that social media is great when there are, is a good faith effort to understand something, but it is not a good place to debate. It's not really a good place to convince people that don't want to be convinced. And then the last one, which is really the most important of all, be mindful of what you post. Because what you post, it can be incredibly hurtful and it can ruin your life. Um, a screenshot is forever. So you, you can't just delete, you know, your, your impact on the social media metaverse. 
there's a fine line between debate and insult on the internet. And you see that people like to escalate very, very quickly on the internet. So before you post, just think, will this tweet do harm? Does this tweet align with my goals? And you know, on Twitter's um, kind of the, the things that they have that, that really help you, um, they actually will, if you put you know, derogatory terms in your post, they will actually ask you, do you really want to post this? Um, which is, a, I think, a great feature. Just have people, just take a, a second to, to think about what they're about to post. Okay, so um, let me see, are there any questions in the chat or? Yes, yes, so th there's a good uh, point in the chat about also being, being mindful of what you respond to and what you open, you know, you don't wanna open the floodgates essentially. Okay, so that's it for Twitter. Um, so if you have any questions on Twitter, you know, just go ahead and post them in the chat or unmute yourself. I'm just going to really briefly touch on all of these other social media platforms and what I think the benefits, you know, the pros and cons of these other platforms are, especially as compared to Twitter. Um, I think that because Twitter is, you know, social media first and then kind of STEM professionals came and made their own space on there, it has, it has really a lot of benefit that you wouldn't necessarily expect and is able to accomplish a lot of the things that may be linked in you know, tries to accomplish, but can't do so as organically. So with LinkedIn, this is a professional blog. And I really think of it as like a, a digital CV. It has tools to help users find career opportunities. So a, a pro is that it is explicitly professional. You know, this, this platform is for you to network professionally. It is not necessarily for you to showcase all of your interests, but more your career interests and your career achievements. It's designed to connect professionals. Um, but some of the cons of that is that then it's associated with work. So anyone that's on there is probably thinking of something work related. And you know, because of that, it's used more by people who are either looking for jobs or looking for employees and not just people who are you know, just kind of going through their career you know, naturally. Um, and then another issue that I see come up a lot is that women can experience unprofessional interactions. Um, you know, people in their DM saying things. Uh, this is something that I personally don't have experience on, but I, you know, I, first of all, it's unacceptable. And second of all, it is something to mention that even though this is an explicitly professional space, um, some people will, will abuse, um, you know, their interactions. Okay, Facebook. So Facebook is kind of like a personal web page. Um, and in the United States, at least, it has a much older user base. But globally, the usership, sometimes Facebook in certain countries is actually considered like the internet because everything goes through um, Facebook. It has a very powerful advertising uh, platform. It's very good for businesses. And again, using these algorithms, it can target ads. And I think that ad targeting can be good and bad. You know, if, if you are a small business and you're using ad targeting to get people who are interested in, in what you're selling um, to, to see what you're selling, I think it can be good. But if you're using it to influence political elections, not so good. Um, and then it's very popular and even essential in other countries, not the, outside of the US. But some of the cons of Facebook, you have very high levels of misinformation and you know a lot of these posts tend to be the most viral. Um, there's a lot of junk posts and clickbait now. And at least from my experience, it's not used as much by the scientific community, but there can be a, you know, accounts on there and people that are using Facebook really fruitfully to get out the message on science. Um, but I just think that it's, you know, a little bit older than some of the newer platforms that have emerged. So Instagram, uh, Black and Cancer actually uses Instagram a lot to advertise um, initiatives as well as events. And this is like a personal photo album. It's very current and trendy. You can share pictures, infographics, and threads on topics. I mean, again, a benefit is that it's not explicitly professional. So you can get your message out across, uh, you know, a message that's associated with science or, or, or career, you can get it across to a diverse array of people. But I think it's just not as easy to kind of go viral or get a message out because it doesn't really have like a retweet type of function or like a reshare type of function unless you actually go and repost something. 
And then uh, you have TikTok. So this will be short video clips. And this is very current and very trendy. Um, you know, I, I don't even have TikTok. So, I mean, I shouldn't even be talking about this at all. I'll be honest. Um, but I know that I know that at least Rhea Harewood and Dr. Julia Morris have done some things on, on TikTok. And so you can share short, entertaining videos, um, especially on scientific topics. This is how I've seen Black and Cancer use it. Again, this is not explicitly professional, so you can get your message out to pretty much anyone. It's a lot easier to go viral on TikTok, um, and you can share TikTok posts on other platforms. It's very common to share TikTok posts on other platforms. Um, but I just don't think it's as popular for the scientific community quite yet. Let's see what's happening. Got some TikTok folks. Yes. Okay, so just some closing thoughts on social media. So social media can lead to real world benefits. And these benefits, you know, they're, they're going to align with your goals. You can find job opportunities and paid events. You can find colleagues and participants for new initiatives. You can, you know, expand your network in this way. You can learn about new research, research in your field, research about coronavirus, research outside of your field. You can explore hobbies and interests with others. Um, and then, you know, focus on organic networking and getting involved. That's the best way to expand your network. I don't think that networking needs to be something that's forced. And then this point, you know, I, I really come to appreciate, which is that a small account can facilitate networking just as well as a large account. Um, and in my experience, I've actually seen that um, the, the more that my account has grown, the harder it is for me to network with the people that are, you know, in my immediate circle without actually explicitly going and creating a list of everyone that is. Um, so having a smaller account, it's a lot more manageable and it actually streamlines that process. Of course, be mindful of what you post. Be that, I think this actually is number one, you know, first things first, be mindful of what you post. And then the second thing is be mindful of what you engage with on the internet, because what you engage with affects what you will see in the future and then you know, it's, it's kind of a cycle in that way. Um, and, and also just remembering that you are in a bubble. You're not seeing the whole picture. You're seeing really what it's tailored for you exactly. Um, so if anyone has any questions, comments, you know, you can use the chat, unmute yourself. Um, you know, I, I, my, my uh, perspective is not exhaustive. There's a lot of different expertise and, and ideas that I think people on this call may have about social media that they can also contribute to the conversation. All right, so we are slowly rounding the hour and perhaps we will leave with a minute to spare. Um, so with that, I would like to really thank you, Chris. This was really insightful and really important topic to really discuss. Um, and I hope everybody got a lot out of it. And um, I, cer I certainly have. And, and so with that, you know, again, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and thank you everyone for really tuning in and engaging and asking good questions. Um, this is our last event of the year. Uh, so um, we have Black and Cancer. We wish you a happy holidays and a safe one. And uh, we will ring in the new year and hopefully um, we'll be catching you all on more events. Thanks everyone.